I, I, I wanted to move us on to two things now, really. Um, you, you mentioned in passing uh, Martin signing a book of poems, and he says a poet is a man who is able to make a judgment. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a great line. Yes. Um, and I wondered, I mean, Martin is very dear to these spaces. He was beloved by my father. I was raised with the sound of Martin's poems in the background. Daddy used to shave and recite. <laughs> he used to bathe and recite. Um, and I, you, you will have seen some of his more withering denunciations of self-contempt and so on. But there were other judgments. Uh, and, and in fact, I think that many of them were extremely positive judgments that we have yet to live up to. I mean, this was the really exhilarating part of Martin for me. Daddy once said that he had a much higher idea of us all than we did of ourselves. And that part of what gave him this prophetic force was you felt you had to live up to it. That you didn't wish to disappoint Martin. Um, it's been a heavy, heavy loss. But what specifically has been lost? What are the judgments that someone like Martin made that are no longer being made? Not helping Martin, in the last years, in the last years, I mean, from the time he withdrew from active politics, let us say, and concentrated more and more on poetry, and um, I said somewhere in there that in those years, you know, he, he looked inwards and the poetry turned inwards, and that's when he produced a lot of the more complex, very hermetic, strange mm -hmm. sort of poetry. Um, but I think, I stayed in contact with him even in you know the days of great activity. He always looked at me and shook his head and you know told me that you know this thing that I was doing, I should really re reconsider what it is I was doing and so on and so on. Because by then, of course, he had had his fill. Um, had become very disenchanted with two political parties <laughs> that he had devoted himself to. Um, but he had a great um, he had a great love for the WPA. He, really did. And, um, I would go and see him come off the streets, stop in Lamaha Street, go in the back room, smoke endless bristles, <laughs> and, um, and we'd be there. And, and what we had kind of resorted to doing in the last days was that I would, we would share a book. In other words, we'd read the same book. Oh, and, read the and, and go and spend some time <laughs> together. I lent him my book on Russian formalism. Um, which he eventually gave me back, and frankly, it's completely unreadable. Yeah, I know, a fantastic annotator. Yeah. Um, and the last book, in fact, we were looking at was this really extraordinary little book by Auerbach called Dante. Dante. Oh, Poet of the Secular, Secular World. World. Wonderful. Fabulous book, yes. And we were sharing that, actually, mm -hmm. when, when we died. Um, so we never completed our discussion of that. But, um, not having Martin there, I mean, he was such an extraordinary moral force. Um, and uh, when you went to see him, whatever kind of mood he was in, I think he always, he always left feeling that, you know, there was, um, there was something out there that you had to fight for, something that was better that you mm -hmm. had not yet seen. Um, so that notwithstanding all of his, you know, his despair towards the end, um, you know, he, he, he remained somebody who was um, a great believer in the, you know, the triumph of the spirit. I mean, mm -hmm. he was, really felt that um, it was important not to lose touch with that. Well, I, uh, thinking in less elitist terms about conversations about culture and politics and so on. I mean, obviously, there was a fairly high level here because we had like Michael Jost could talk about Wilson and <laughs> Martin could talk about everyone. <laughs> um, but <laughs> perfect interlude. Um, I remember Roy Heath uh, published some memoirs about 20 years ago about Georgetown in the 40s and 50s, it may have been. And there was this wonderful vignette of barber shops, and you would go to the barber shop, and a haircut would take four hours because you'd read the newspaper, and there would be a sports uh, maven, 
and he would tell you why spin is coming back and what the pitch would do on the third day. And then you go to politics and someone would explain the history of Islamic fundamentalism in Egypt and so on. And the, the society was talking to itself at a very deep level and it was processing the world in exactly the way that culture is meant to. And I remember reading this and thinking, well, it was a very working class scene, so I, I obviously was never among it. But it sounded fantastic and, and wonderful and, and exactly what gives rise to the intelligence. It is always there in Guyana when I come back and always I feel, I'm, you know, the wit and so on. But then that's gone. And then rum shops to some extent took over because you could meet all sorts of characters in a rum shop. But even those now just seem to be drowned in loud music and full of you know, spitting and cussing and so on. So I wondered where has this cultural brooding migrated? It's certainly not migrated to Parliament, as you well know. I mean, so it, it, it seems to me that there's a great deal of intelligence around in the society, and it's now hiding. But where is it hiding? And where do we find it? Because, I mean, something like this trust is attempting to reconnect these little conversations. And I, I, I have a feeling that there are one or two places where some of this is happening. I haven't been frequenting them myself, but I do believe there are one or two places where some of this is happening. Not enough of it is happening. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that there are, I'm not a great rub shop frequenter myself, but I, I understand that there are one or two uh, preserving the old traditions. Really? Uh, where there's no loud music, but there's a lot of discussion and so on that is taking place. Um, but as a, a widespread phenomenon, I think that it's you know, part of what alas, has been lost. Um, and, uh, you know, I frequently say to myself that part of my despair, if it can be called that, about our present situation is that I have felt for some time now that I'm not sure that we have within the borders of Guyana any longer the critical mass that is required to bring about certain kinds of transformation. And that happens to I happen to believe that has to do with political transformation as well as some of the transformations that you're talking about. Um, a lot of what has happened to the population, the extent to which outward migration has really, you know, gone in deep swathes into, into, you know, people who would otherwise be here having conversations like the one you described. Mm -hmm. They're probably elsewhere. Because I, I think, I mean, not to get too ideological, but there's a terrible tendency among the, the sort of now effete middle class, the, the vestigial middle class, that gathers in places like this to take their experience as the only experience in a society like this uh, at a certain cultural level. I mean, I, I, I found that in many parts of the Caribbean. And that only collapses on politics and sport. Uh, you, because the analysis of batting style and so on is not seen to be a preserve of the literate middle class with foreign degrees. And it seems a terrible shame that that sort of attitude couldn't widen out to include music, books, dance, theater, and so on, because it did once, clearly. Yes. Um, and I, I wonder, do you ha are you more optimistic than me? I mean, I did... You know, Noam Chomsky once said that if you want to see the real intelligence of America, don't look for its political commentary. Listen to its analysis of baseball, because they can retain fantastic numbers of statistics and analysis and so on. And this is the working man's mind in action. And baseball is infinitely more complicated than American politics, and possibly more significant. <laughs> and, and something like, you know, test cricket is too at a yeah. certain level, uh, and, and the critical faculties are still completely alive. People will analyze Lara's back lift and this and that, and, and they'll, they'll go on at length. But then if you, you shifted the ground only slightly, they would say, well, I don't know about that. And that seems a terribly desperate moment for a culture to be in. Do you, do you feel that there's, I mean, obviously you're, you're on my side, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand, you know, where it went. Um, I mean, that world that, that, that Heath describes, um, you know, that ferment, mm -hmm. um, where it went and exactly when it disappeared, 
I I I, I don't know. Um, my hope is that it's happening. It's happening. We don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. It's out of sight. Um, but I feel it must be happening. If it's not happening, then the society is completely dead. So I prefer to think it's happening and we don't know where it is. I hope to. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, I, I don't want us to go too far past the hour. We've already reached an hour. And I certainly wanted us to take a couple of questions from the audience. I just wanted to, to close with a final thought that um, I'm sure you've read this wonderful book, This Like Company of People Who Care. Yeah. It filled me with very mixed emotions. Um, I think it's a, great, it's a great book. It captures Guyana in its entirety. Um, it, it's a bizarre act for a foreign writer to commit. And it, it made me feel very sad that a Guyanese writer had not come up with that novel. Because then it, there would have been evidence of this literary intelligence out there. But it was a, it's a, it's a, a minor masterpiece of observation and ethnography and so on. Um, what were your thoughts on it? I mean, do you feel that that sort of literature is now only available to the sort of intelligent literate foreigner who comes here, or or no? Um, I don't know. I don't know that there is anyone right now who's operating within Guyana um, with that kind of. Um, with that kind of aptitude and, um, and so on. I, I mean, the current, the current literary scene, as I understand it, I mean, they've had, they've been workshops here at Moray House mm -hmm. where some young people have come, and those have been very encouraging. And I know that there are, there are groups of young people who are at work, some of them producing reasonably good work. But the kind of the kind of major output that you're describing, for instance, in that novel, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that at the present time there are people around who have that kind of um, capacity. 